Hi, my name is Arianna and I am a volcanologist. What I like the best about it is the fact that it pulls from a lot of different disciplines. So if you want to get into volcanology, you can have all sorts of different skill sets. There is no such thing as a typical day on the job. We all live for the two weeks more or less out of a year where we get to go out and do field work. We travel to a real volcano, sometimes an erupting one, and we get to make observations and collect samples and that all happens while going on awesome hikes. So that is only a short part of it. The majority of the time we actually spend it in our office and we could be running experiments, which is also pretty cool. And we also have to write papers or write grants to get funding to go on the next expedition. And so things really change on a day-to-day -day basis. Could you talk about a recent project that you've been working on? Sure, so right now I am studying the Kilauea 2018 eruption. So this is the eruption that occurred in a while last summer that um, was really big on the news for a long time. Unfortunately, we got to hear about how a lot of houses and, and property were taken down and it was mainly lava flows. What I do to study that eruption is make experiments on samples of that lava. It means that I have rocks that were collected uh, during or right after the eruption and I melt them in a furnace and I stir them to measure their viscosity. Viscosity is thickness, stickiness, and it tells us something about how fast lava flows move and how far they might get so that we can refine our hazard maps for the next eruption. What are some of the common misconceptions that people have about volcanoes? You know, a lot of us imagine that there is a huge pool of magma and that the Earth's crust is just floating above it. So basically, you know, where there's a volcanic eruption in, in our mind, what we picture is that there's, there's this magma that's just like sitting there waiting to be erupted and at some point it comes up and boom, you have an eruption. In reality, magma chambers are nothing like that. Magma chambers are mostly solid. So even after you have formed magma, which is something pretty rare, it only happens at certain spots. But even after you have formed this magma, and it has risen and it has accumulated in the magma chamber, there's only, you know, maybe 50% of really molten stuff there. The rest is solid, it's crystal, so it's bubbles. And then the other one that I want to tackle is that we hear a lot in the news about volcanoes being overdue or volcanic eruptions being overdue. This is not a thing from a volcanologist perspective. We can talk about the general frequency of eruptions, right? So there are volcanoes like uh, Stromboli in southern Italy, which erupt all the time. And by all the time, I mean every 10 minutes for the past few centuries. They're extremely regular. And then there's volcanoes which have bigger eruptions who erupt much more rarely. Think the Yellowstone, we're talking thousands if not millions of years. So the interval basically between the last two eruptions does not predict in how long there's, there's going to be the next one. So statistically it is just as likely that if a volcano had a big eruption yesterday it will have another one tomorrow. So really, when you hear the media talking about Yellowstone is overdue, we are all doomed, that's not a thing. Yes, they might have been a little longer since it last erupted than we would have expected, but there's nothing to worry about. How do you predict or estimate when a volcano will erupt? Basically, the game is trying to spot magma as it rises, because magma is sitting in the chamber and then before the eruption, it, it has to come up all, all the way to the surface. When it does, there are a few things that happen and that we as volcanologists can try to catch and interpret. Magma has to crack its way up. Typically, there is not a conduit that is just an empty pipe and is waiting to, to be filled by magma rising. So every time that magma wants to rise, it has to, to crack, to open up, its, make its own way to the surface. And this generates earthquakes that have a specific frequency that we can detect with our seismometers. The volcano usually inflates, you know, much uh, like a cake inflates in, in the oven. And again, that's because there's this extra volume of the magma that is moving up. And that we can also pick up with instruments both on the ground and then from satellite as well. 
And then we look at um, gas emissions because when magma rises, it degasses. It's the same mechanism as when you open a bottle of soda and, and bubbles are released. We can detect the, the change in the, in the composition of the gases that, um, that come out of the volcano. So sometimes we uh, can catch those signals and say that an eruption is about to happen. Right now, we are definitely not at the point where we can say an eruption is going to happen in three hours, in a week, in five months, but we can say an eruption is preparing, it will be happen shortly. How are volcanoes a creative force in our world and why are they essential for life? Volcanoes get a bad reputation often because they're always in the news when they've destroyed property or worse killed someone. In reality, volcanoes have done a lot for shaping our planet. For example, they're responsible for the creation of emerged lands and of the vast majority of our atmosphere and they are relevant to life. We think that they might have supported the very first ecosystems by providing the elements necessary for it and providing the, the energy to, to support these primordial forms of life. And the really cool thing is that these exotic ecosystems that even nowadays exist in proximity of volcanoes, these environments give us an idea of uh, what life might look like in other worlds, in other planets. And so astrobiologists, which is scientists who look for life on other planets, tend to do so on geologically active worlds because those are the ones that uh, have the highest chance of, of hosting life. And it's really cool, it's really important to have an idea of what to look for. That's a really cool role that volcanoes have uh, in the development of life on Earth and possibly on other planets. A hypothetical situation, you and other volcanologists believe that an eruption will occur. What steps do you take to prepare the people or cities nearby? Okay, so that's a bit of a misconception also, so thanks for, for bringing this up. Normally we don't do anything as volcanologists about that. And that is because this is not our job. Our job is to figure out when is the next eruption going to happen. And then what we do is we communicate that to the civil protection or local emergency management. And it's up to them to decide how to best uh, inform the population. And for example, if we need to have an evacuation and so if these people need to move out, where do they need to go, for how long they need to stay away from, from their homes. Uh, so for example, what will happen is we have the signs that an eruption might be imminent. So we call the civil protection and we say, hey, we think that an eruption might be about to happen and you know, based on our expertise, we believe, for example, that it will be an explosive eruption. So the kind of hazard that you have to worry about there is mainly ash. And the ash, you know, based on wind directions and volcano topography, might be going to the north. And then based on those information, the civil protection will make their judgment call and say if and when some steps need to, to be taken to protect the population. Can you describe what it's like to walk into the mouth of an active volcano? It's a pretty special feeling and I recommend everybody to try that for themselves in a place where it's safe to do so. Uh, but I can try to describe it for you. So usually the landscape is like walking on a different planet. So see, I'm holding rocks in my hand and it's because I want to give you an idea of what that might look like. So the landscape is often completely black, like this rock I'm holding here in my left hand. And it might be pretty barren because volcanoes constantly emplace new land in the form of lava. And it takes quite a while before life, for example, plants and then animals can colonize it. You will see uh, weird things sometimes. So for example, you might see pools of water with incredible colors because there's minerals which provide this, this color. You might have all sorts of gases coming out. So for example, you could have sulfur. So there's going to be that rotten egg smell that people often correctly associate with volcanoes. And then you'll see deposits of, of different colors. So for example, you could see pumice. This is kind of rock that forms during explosive eruptions and it's really light because it has uh, a lot of bubbles. And so you might see some spots that, um, that look differently. If you are lucky, you might also get to see some activity happening. So for example, you could see some lava coming out of the crater. But in that case, as a tourist, you probably don't want to be there too close. Usually when there is an ongoing eruption, 
these places are, are no longer accessible. So what is some information that people could benefit from before visiting a volcano to get more out of their experience? I recommend that you look up the website of the local volcano observatory, if there is one. They have a lot of information that are going to be critical, first of all, for your safety while you're visiting, but then also to give you those instruments to really understand what is it that you're seeing. Really focus on the images that they have up there. It's really cool to see, for example, a deposit, a layer of rock that looks a different color and all of a sudden being able to tell hey, that is a lighter layer, and the reason why it's like that is because it's this eruption that happened 350 years ago, for example. Uh, so it's, it's really nice to, to have that ability of basically read the landscape. And if the local volcano does not have an observatory, I recommend that at least you read something up about it. Um, find a textbook or um, a website. There's a lot of information out there. Always be a bit skeptical of what you're reading. Uh, there is also something that's called Outcropedia. It's a website where geologists report really cool outcrops, so basically rock exposures. You might be able to find something about the volcano you're about to visit over there as well. How do volcanoes bridge the gap between culture and science? So of course they have inspired us as humans for centuries to create art and they've become part of, of our culture. One of the classic examples that is cited is the effect that the Tambora eruption in 1816 had on art. Turner, an English painter, was really inspired by the incredibly vivid colors of, of sunsets and the reason for those colors is that this gigantic eruption put a lot of gases for example sulfur in circulation in the atmosphere and those really brought out those those sunset colors it is also said that the volcanic eruption inspired mary shelley to write frankenstein got her to spend a summer pretty uh, secluded and this gave her the time to think about the novel and, and really develop it Emily Dickinson wrote many poems about volcanoes, although she never actually got to see one herself, but she got to hear about reports from other people who traveled to them and were really struck by them and decided to write poetry about them. Please give us your plug. Are there any resources that people should check out if they want to learn more about the work that you do or volcanoes in general? Your number one source should be the Global Volcanism Project. That is something that is maintained by the Smithsonian. And basically uh, it is an incredible database of all volcanoes and all eruptions and there are informations about the history of each volcano, there are reports from the local observatories about um, current activity, and so there's, there's really a wealth of information out there. And then I'm going to suggest something completely different, which is um, Volcano Twitter. So our community is really into this. There are a lot of volcanologists like myself, um, Janine Krippner and many others who tweet a lot about volcanoes, about current eruptions, about new discoveries, and that is kind of a cool way to, to stay in touch with what's new in, in the community and knowing that it really comes from volcanologists and so it's a reliable source.